Black Hawk Down is the most memorable war film from my childhood that makes me ask questions about the history of foreign interventions and what responsibility we have in helping other nations. Let's talk about it. So, growing up back in the early 2000s, I had an interest in military history and modern warfare. The first time my parents were able to get cable television, I was just addicted to the History Channel at that time. Also, my mom took us to the public library a lot and let us borrow VHS documentaries on World War II and the American Civil War. Around 2004, I was able to watch the 2001 war film Black Hawk Down and was truly amazed by the cinematography and the way the film portrayed violence on screen. This film and the events it was covering was talked about a lot in the community I was living in and the people I was around. See, I grew up in Clarksville, Tennessee, and nearby was the Fort Campbell Military Base, which is the home of the 160th Special Operations Aviation Regiment. There are so many veterans and military personnel who live in Clarksville, and so naturally we met many veterans of the Gulf War, Iraq and Afghan War, and also the troops who participated in the Battle of Mogadishu. For example, Mike Durant, the famous Black Hawk pilot who was shot down and captured in the Battle of Mogadishu, had lived for a period of time in Fort Campbell and I believe my mother who is a contractor had actually met him while doing a job on a home. There were many other Black Hawk pilots we met who gave their accounts of the battle and also loved and critiqued the film. Besides that, Mark Bowden, the author of the book Black Hawk Down, which the movie is based upon, seemed to be invited onto a lot of documentaries and programs on the History Channel. As I remember, so many specials came out at that time discussing the battle in Somalia and other regional conflicts in Africa. This period of time, I feel, was where the History Channel not only focused on World War II documentaries, but I also saw many intriguing documentaries on the Sierra Leone War, the war in Liberia, and other conflicts affecting East Africa. Africa at this time was so fascinating to me, not only for the vast natural landscapes, but the regional cultural differences within the continent. There was so much news coming out of West Africa and Central Africa of the continued wars and famines that were happening. So when I saw Black Hawk Down, I immediately became interested in the events around that period. So to give you all some necessary background, in January 1991, militias overthrew the regime of President Syed Bayar, which led to the Somalia Civil War. The United Nations later arranged a US-led intervention with a mandate to engage in state building and encourage the militias to share power and begin to form a new government. Uninterested in sharing power, Muhammad Farah Aidid, a local general and warlord, began to regard the ongoing UN mission as hostile and ambushed a peacekeeping convoy in June 1993, killing 24 Pakistani soldiers. After the US-led July 12, 1993 Abdi House Raid, which resulted in the death of many eminent members of Adid's clan, Farah Aidid would begin deliberately targeting American troops for the first time. As a result, President Clinton approved Operation Gothic Serpent, a JSOC mission to apprehend Farah Aidid. The operation created Task Force Ranger, which was composed of the Rangers, Delta Force, 24th Special Tactics Squadron Airmen, Navy SEALs, and 160th SOAR Aviators. The Battle of Mogadishu happened on October 3rd, 1993. U.S. forces planned to seize two of Adid's top lieutenants during a meeting deep in the city. The raid was only intended to last an hour, but morphed into an overnight standoff and rescue operation as two Black Hawk helicopters were shot down, extending the operation into the daylight hours of the next day. While the goal of the operation was a Achieved, it was a Pyrrhic victory, which spiraled into a brutal and bloody battle. What's so interesting about these series of events is that the U.S. had to take on the role of this operation of intervening in an African nation to prevent a famine. But why at this period of time, and why did the U.S. have to intervene? 
I understand the good that came from the operations in terms of preventing thousands from starving to death, but even the director Ridley Scott pointed out in the film commentary that Americans tend to have the burden of intervening into nations with no beneficial outcome for our own country, no significant support or aid from other powerful European nations, with exceptions of course, and being criticized when the operation is a bloody mess. I think even so, abroad, there's still a lot of metaphorical eyeball rolling saying, oh God, here go the Americans again with their jingoistic view on what they do, which of course infuriates me because I'm English and, uh, and I made the movie and so this is my view on it. And so what I say to them, even to journalists abroad who say, you know, here's the American thing again, you know, we're going to go in there and we're going to kick butt. And I'm saying, well, mate, I didn't notice you going in there afterwards. I didn't. I haven't seen the Spanish in the, there. I haven't seen much of the French. I haven't seen much of the support from other the other nations. Uh, a bit from the English, uh, a bit of UN, but essentially the Americans are doing it all, and uh, that's what I've seen happen time and time again over the years. And I just think it is the lot of the community of those who can afford to should. Even with the bravery and heroism of our American soldiers, the losses that we took at the Battle of Mogadishu and the collateral damage that came with it impacted our willingness to involve ourselves in future interventions. President Clinton would later state that due to the costly battle, he and many other politicians and military personnel felt it a huge risk to send a large force to end the Rwandan genocide in April 1994. So you have two catastrophes. The Battle of Mogadishu in October of 1993 and the bloody outcome which influenced many US officials on intervention and then months later the Rwandan genocide happened and we saw a lack of intervention from the US and other powerful nations allowing the genocide to last about a hundred days. So with all that said about how this intervention seemed to be somewhat of a disaster it's interesting that a film about this event would be made and how well received it was at that time. But it makes sense considering the period it came out in the early 2000s. Around this time we had almost a resurgence of war films as one of the greatest World War II films came out in 1998. Saving Private Ryan was and still is a visual masterpiece of a film with spectacular performances and great cinematography. The impact the film had on culture is quite incredible as there had not been such a stunning film like it previously. There have been and still are so many reviews and analysis videos of this particular film and its impact on filmmakers to this day. After the film was released, there came a time where, as I remember it, it was promoted on the History Channel and many other educational television channels. These channels realized the demand for World War II and military content, and it seemed many other channels like the Military Channel, National Geographic, and Discovery Channel were producing engaging documentaries on modern conflicts. Then in 2001, Band of Brothers, which was created by Steven Spielberg, who directed Saving Private Ryan, came out on HBO and became one of, in my opinion, the best miniseries of all time, with the premiere drawing in 10 million viewers on September 9th, 2001. So with the success of Saving Private Ryan, Band of Brothers, and the growing interest in war documentaries and programs, it seemed this was the perfect time to make more of these types of films. Ridley Scott, just coming off the super successful film Gladiator, was hired on to direct the movie after Jerry Bruckheimer bought the rights to the book and another director dropped out of the project. The movie simply is a war event or battle film. What I mean by that is that Black Hawk Down is essentially giving a sort of recounting of the events that happened in the Battle of Mogadishu over the course of two days and that's pretty much it. The film starts off in Somalia and doesn't really give us too much background. We don't know much about Garrison, the general in charge of operations. We don't know much about the other key political players involved. We don't learn that much about Mohammed Farah Idid, 
the warlord the US military is after. We don't really know more than what the beginning title cards tell us about how the intervention force was there to prevent the famine and genocide occurring in that failed country. There's no more background information on the Somali civil war or about the other elements of the intervention forces present in the country. After that, the information we get is about the American soldiers there and their preparation for the operation thinking it will be an easy fight. The film has an amazing cast of actors such as Eric Bana, Josh Hartnett, Owen McGregor, and Tom Sizemore who give great performances considering they really aren't truly developed characters with great backgrounds. There really are no conventional main characters as the film isn't focusing necessarily on them individually but instead on the team itself and the soldiers participating in the battle. I think Ridley Scott says it's best in the film commentary. Josh Hartnett, I would guess, is the um, character in the film that would be, in terms of normal movies, classified as the leading character, even though uh, he's on and off screen fairly regular intervals. This film is not conventional in the sense of having conventional characterization where, you know, the film is subsequent to the good guy and the bad guy and everybody else revolves around those two characters. This was very much a film which was a team effort because as it was we were taking a hundred functionaries protagonists and we were distilling them down as far as we could get to tell a cohesive story and uh, where we got to was the I couldn't get it much but about 37 characters which by normal standards is about 32 characters more than you ought to have and so that was tricky and that was something I was always concerned about that would people be prepared or would they want to follow these guys who are coming and going and then you know, re-emerging during the process of the story, would they eventually be able to hang their hat on, you know, sympathetically, their sympathetic hat or curiosity or interest on these characters when there was a large team rather than specific individuals. But I think Josh did a great job and actually he does stand out as to what he's, I think, probably predestined to be and that it, I would think is probably a big stop. While Josh Hartnett is the typical leading man, Eric Bana is, quoting from Ridley Scott, the mature voice of the film. While like the rest of the characters having little development and background, the performance given by Eric Bana is him basically being a representative of the special forces soldiers who quietly and efficiently do their brutal and bloody work of fighting in all those foreign wars. Black Hawk Down isn't new in that the film doesn't focus on the characters but simply the event. But where I think it deviates from similar movies is the overall great quality of the film. The movie is a spectacle of violence. You see how the US military at that time period carried out the operation, the weapons they used, the tactics that were employed, and the urban environments they were fighting in as the choice of shooting locations was excellent for attempting to recreate Mogadishu. Many veterans have commented at how accurate the film was at portraying the battle. Or the military personnel who have seen the picture say this is the, one of the best war movies or the best war movie that they've ever seen because it, it really gets it right. We've got so many letters from soldiers and parents around the world who have um, had either their kids involved in Somalia or just fans uh, of the movie and, and talking about the accuracy. And I think three of the most scary screenings that I went to with Ridley were when we took the film to the various military bases. We took it to Fort Bragg, Fort Benning, and Fort Campbell. Uh, where the various men uh, were trained in for Somalia and some of them are still uh, posted there and, and um, we had a whole group had just come back from Afghanistan fighting over there and we showed them the movie and they came up and thanked us uh, with tears in their eyes for making the picture and for uh, I guess the attention to detail that Ridley put into the picture so the fact that 200 of them lined up uh, after the screen just to shake our hands and thank us uh, felt great this was the peak of Ridley Scott's career, and I am reminded of how he can make such beautiful looking films as the expert use of filters and the cinematography is what makes this film stand out from other war media. The first time I watched the film, it was an incredible visual experience for me, and watching it repeatedly just reminds me of that fact. It is the best display of modern warfare that I have ever seen. Now, is this film pro-war propaganda? Yes. 
But does that take away the interest I have in this complex film? No. Really, Scott states in the commentary that he wasn't attempting to make a pro-war or jingoistic film, but instead he wanted to make a pro-military film that was simply honoring the soldiers that fought and died in the Battle of Mogadishu. It's what my story was. I wanted people to know what these guys do and what they, these guys do for a living, for the most part, on our behalf. So, I guess at the end of the day, the film is anti-war, which anyone in their right mind making a film about war, I hope is going to be a serious film about war, is going to be anti-war. It can hardly be pro-war, but oddly enough, anti-war, but this is pro-military. It's pro what these individuals do in present circumstances today in this present world in this present situation. Of course you can simply disregard Ridley Scott's comments and say the film is not only a pro-war film but an example of American military propaganda that once again fails in trying to be anti-war. Therefore, there is not much positive to take from the film. Or you can recognize the faults of the film and better analyze and appreciate the movie. I feel a great example of fair and useful analysis is that from Rob Ager on Saving Private Ryan. Ager points out that while Spielberg tried making an anti-war film, the end result of Saving Private Ryan is a pro-American pro-war film that has some glaring issues with it, such as the American justification of committing war crimes. Does this though take away his appreciation, or mine for that matter, of the film? Of course not, and he recognizes how the film is a wonderfully made piece of cinema, as I do as well. This can be applied to Black Hawk Down. There is a fair criticism of the film that I can understand that it only gives the perspective of the American forces and not that of the Somalis. Why don't we get the perspective of the Somali civilians? We don't really get any point of view from the Somali leaders or civilians as they weren't even Somali actors used in the movie. Somali nationals have said the African actors chosen to play the Somalis in the film do not resemble the culturally unique features of the Horn of Africa, nor does the language they communicate in the movie sound like the Afro-Asiatic tongue spoken by the Somali people. They also state the abrasive way lines are delivered and the lack of authenticity regarding Somali culture fails to capture the tone, mannerisms, and spirit of actual life in Somalia. Besides the cultural issues, I feel the film needed to maybe give more of a perspective from one or a few Somalis as they witnessed or participated in the Battle of Mogadishu. Besides not really understanding the justification for the U.S. intervention into Somalia, we never really get the opinions from the civilians of the U.N. forces and the U.S. presence in their country or the opinions they ultimately have of the conflict between Farah Idid and the U.S. military. The two scenes that come close are the conversation Gerald Garrison has with Osman Otto, a faction leader selling arms to Idid's militia, as we get a brief conversation about how the Americans shouldn't intervene in their civil war. And the conversation we see a fighter has with the captured Mike Durant. These brief scenes aren't satisfactory in my opinion, as we only see an arms dealer questioning General Garrison and a Somali fighter justifying the violence present in their culture. Other than those two, we see no other Somalis giving their views on the US, the UN forces, the warlords ruling over their country, and how they survive living in a failed state. Now, with that criticism said, the only question I had since the first time I saw this film and the questions I still have every time I rewatch the movie is when is foreign military intervention necessary and why is it usually the burden for the US military? Black Hawk Down was released in December of 2001, three months after the September 11th terrorist attacks, soon after we saw the invasion of Afghanistan and later the invasion of Iraq. The film came out at a time when Americans saw the war on terrorism as a necessary war and felt it was right for our invasions of these Middle Eastern countries in the hopes of hunting down terrorists and wiping them out. Today though, we see these military actions as simply failures for causing large amounts of suffering in these countries and not really accomplishing our goals. This is nothing new of course as the US has a long history of bloody and pointless interventions 
that though they might have had noble goals, were ultimately failures. Even military interventions that may have seemed to be successful at the time are controversial and still considered major blunders for the US and their allies. NATO carried out an aerial bombing campaign against the Federal Republic of Yugoslavia during the Kosovo War, which lasted from the 24th of March in 1999 till June 10th. NATO's intervention was prompted by Yugoslavia's bloodshed and ethnic cleansing of Albanians which drove the Albanians into neighboring countries and had the potential to destabilize the region. Even though it was technically a NATO victory, with the withdrawal of Yugoslav forces from Kosovo and the return of Albanian refugees to that country, there were large amounts of civilian casualties, extensive damage to homes and infrastructure, and many ethnic Serbs and Roma were targeted and displaced from Kosovo. The legitimacy of the intervention has been debated and is still controversial to this day. The same thing can be said about the intervention in Somalia. But then there is the other question. Have there been times when foreign military intervention is absolutely essential? Because while it's easy for people to criticize the US and other groups for their interventions, there is an event after Somalia that possibly demanded a military intervention. Several months after the Battle of Mogadishu in April 1994, ethnic Hutu militias enraged over the death of President Juvenal Habyarimana in an apparent assassination attempt with his plane crash began to launch a large-scale campaign of mass killings of the ethnic Tutsi minority, a group despised by many Hutus and blamed for the president's death. Over the course of a hundred days, Hutu soldiers and civilians, mostly armed with machetes, would hunt down and murder Tutsis many of whom were their neighbors. During this mass killing, no major military intervention force came into the nation to stop the genocide from happening. Like I stated earlier, fear of a repeat of these events in Somalia shaped US policy, with many commentators identifying the Battle of Mogadishu's graphic consequences as the key reason behind the US's decision not to intervene in later conflicts such as the Rwandan genocide of 1994. According to the US's former Deputy Special Envoy to Somalia, Walter Clark, the ghosts of Somalia continued to haunt U.S. policy. Our lack of response in Rwanda was a fear of getting involved in something like a Somalia all over again. An amazing documentary from 2004 called Ghosts of Rwanda, which as of the making of this video is free on YouTube, goes over the events of that genocide in detail and we see interviews of many American political officials who had their hands tied metaphorically as they were present in the country of Rwanda and witnessed the violence happening in April to July 1994. Truly an intense documentary that people need to watch for how horrifying the events were at that time in Rwanda and how many begged for some sizable intervention force to stop the violence. This is what I was thinking about while watching Black Hawk Down. If there was an intervention into Rwanda, why did it have to be solely American forces with our men risking our lives? Why can't the international community develop an effective force that can take on the role of carrying out a military intervention that works and is formidable? Of course, it's hard for us to tell now, but for example, the intervention in Kosovo had some level of success in preventing more deaths of ethnic Albanians. Could have Rwanda been a similar situation in which there would be realistically some successes and failures if it had the similar intervention like Kosovo? Even after 30 years, these questions are still relevant today, as of the making of this video, there are still campaigns of ethnic cleansing and genocides happening worldwide. Notably, right now, ethnic Armenians are being displaced from their homes in Nagorno-Karabakh, and it is possible that there will be further violence. Should the international community get involved in this event? That's an important discussion to have. So, those are the questions I have after watching Black Hawk Down. So I wanted to ask you guys watching to respond in the comment section if you would like. When is military intervention necessary? How should military interventions operate in the future? What are some examples of successful military interventions? With all that said, Black Hawk Down, in my opinion, is still a relevant and important film to watch. If I were to give this film a score, I would give it an 82%. The film doesn't really have developed characters, and we don't get that many other perspectives other than the American soldiers part of Task Force Ranger. When it comes to the positives though, 
The film is incredibly well shot with some fantastic editing. The look of the film is unique with the use of great filters as the cinematography is stunning and the way the violence is portrayed is well done and believable. It is one of the most memorable war films from my childhood and I will be re-watching this film in the future. But what do you guys think of this film? What are your guys' answers to my questions on military intervention? Please leave a comment in the comment section down below and thank you for watching my video. Please subscribe if you want to. Thank you.